My name is Andrew Betwain and I am the Managing Editor of InsuranceInvestor.com. Today I am joined by Sir Howard Davies, Chair of NatWest Group. Sir Howard will be speaking at our Insurance Investor Live Europe Conference in London in September. He'll be doing a keynote presentation on examining the function of monetary and fiscal policy and the role of regulatory oversight can a relaxation in rules and inflation targets prompt real economic growth? Well, that's a really interesting topic. And uh, Sir Howard, I'm really interested to get your thoughts on this. I'm going to dive straight into the questions. So my first question is, with discussions around the UK economy and recessionary conditions, do you see a consensus of monetary and fiscal policy around a stable or even a lower tax environment across the political spectrum? And, and would this encourage spending, as well as combined with measures to unlock insurance capital to propel growth? I think the first thing to say is that we're not necessarily in a recession. Indeed, the IMF's forecast now is that we will avoid a recession this year. And that actually matches my experience here at NatWest, which is that while we are seeing some slowdown in, in spending, we're not seeing conditions which suggest that the economy is really going into reverse. So I think mm -hmm. we're going to see a low growth environment uh, as opposed to an absolute recession. I could be wrong, but that's the way I read it just at the moment. As for the way in which the settings of policy can affect this, well, unfortunately, I think that we can expect interest rates to remain pretty high um, for a decent length of time. Another thing the IMF are noting is that inflationary pressures remain quite strong in the UK and that therefore it's going to be a bit longer here before interest rates starts to go down uh, than perhaps in the United States. As for fiscal policy, the difficult position we're in is that after the fuss of last September with the trust quateng uh, interlude, the government's flexibility on fiscal policy is much less than is often the case because the markets were scared by what they saw last September. Mm. So the government's priority has been to rebuild credibility. Now, eventually, we will rebuild credibility, and the government's made quite a lot of sensible moves in that direction. But I don't think people can expect a big change in the tax burden in the near term, because the priority remains to be to reinsure markets and investors that we have a government that's committed to fiscal prudence in the long term. As for the final part of your question, which was about the way in which regulation can make a difference. Well, there is a reform of Solvency 2 in progress. It's actually being reformed both here and in the European Union in slightly different ways, because I think regulators across Europe have realised that it imposes too severe constraints on some forms of insurance investment, particularly long-term infrastructure investment, which is effectively penalised under the original version of Solvency 2. So I think we can see some relaxation there. But my feeling is that that's likely to result in more of a change in the profile of investment than absolutely an increase in investment, because it isn't a money tree on which we can invent new capital which doesn't currently exist. It's about reorganizing and reorienting that investment uh, in hopefully some more positive directions. Some fascinating thoughts there, and I want to pick up on several of those. So I'm going to dive straight into the question two, which we mentioned earlier in your answer, inflation. So it has eased slightly over the past few months and could further over the summer. So considering this, what should investment teams expect in terms of its impact on growth? Should we expect government policies to reflect this experience by adding or removing fiscal or legal barriers? I think that the conventional wisdom, which has a lot of uh, research and analysis behind it, changes in interest rates take about 18 months to two years to take effect. So the rise in interest rates, which really began um, in uh, the big early 2022, mm. will really be taking effect um, later this year. So we will have some downward pressure on investment and spending um, later this year. Now, the question is, therefore, whether the government can afford to offset that by some fiscal relaxation. There are some grounds to think uh, 
there could be some because the government's debt burden has been going down because one thing inflation does is devalue the quantum of your debt, which is obviously fixed in nominal terms. So the, the debt interest line is going down in, in real terms. So there's some a mm. bit of flexibility there. And we've also seen a lot of fiscal drag. In other words, that tax um, thresholds have been frozen, which brings more people into higher rate taxes, um, which boosts the government's tax receipts. And that means that they have perhaps some flexibility on tax rates. So I think that by later this year, you will start to see more chat about whether the government can, in its 24 budget, begin some fiscal relaxation, which, of course, will be pretty convenient for them because there's an election in prospect. So I think that the government's strategy is, in effect, to say, look, 2023 is going to be a pretty grim year. Real incomes mm -hmm. are falling. There's not a lot we can do on the tax front. But if we peer forward into 2024, maybe we can start to show uh, before the next election that there is uh, some uh, light at the end of this tunnel. Um, but I don't think that one should be looking at the prospect of a very significant relaxation of the tax burden, it's certainly not this year. It's very interesting. And it goes nicely into my next question, which, as you mentioned, we're ramping up to the next election here in the UK. So do you see any possible sweeteners for the city or the financial services industry, i.e. to try and ease the flight of high valued opportunities in terms of domestic IPOs, greater access to green bonds? Uh, do you see any of this by the government or by the Labour Party to get its backing from the city? And is there a difference between the incentives being offered by the Conservatives or the Labour Party? I think we may see um, a few things, but um, the problem is that there's not, again, a lot uh, that the government can do. There aren't many levers that the government can pull. They've commissioned a couple of reports on capital raising in the city by Lord Hill and others. Mm. And some sensible changes are being made. The FCA have proposed some changes. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to these things, but I don't know whether they are likely to unblock a flood of IPOs in London as a result. You know, I, I, I hope that we're in a trough at the moment um, but uh, and that things will pick up later in the year. But um, I, I doubt if the regulatory changes are going to make a massive amount of difference. I think it's going to be more... Um, a, a question of mood and whether people think that, you know, that, that there are some optimistic economic conditions around the corner and therefore it's a good time to begin to uh, to float things. So mm. I, 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 I'm not sure. I, I don't really think that waiting for the regulatory cavalry to come over the hill is a great investment strategy. Now, as for the difference between the Conservatives and Labour, bit difficult to tell because Labour, of course, are keeping their powder dry. <laughs> I don't detect in my own conversations with senior Labour people, there's any sense of resentment about the city particularly or any kind of revenge. I think, you know, Corbyn's well dead and buried. Um, and so I don't expect that they will do a lot that is damaging to the city. Uh, the private equity people, of course, are a bit concerned about the tax treatment of carried interest, uh, which is a, a particular I issue for them. Um, I, you know, I think you can argue that uphill and down Dale, frankly. Uh, but th that may have some effect on the location of private equity houses in, um, in, in London. But it's not that there are that many more favourable tax regimes elsewhere, to be blunt. So I think there could be a little bit of a movement there. Um, I don't think that the city can expect any particular favours from Labour. So, you know, I don't imagine they're going to be taking off the bank levy anytime uh, soon. But then nor are the Conservatives. So uh, I, I, I don't see the I don't feel that there's going to be a huge difference as a result of the next election, the result of which, of course, remains pretty uncertain anyway. 
Yes, it's going to be an interesting uh, election campaign next year. So you've mentioned my next uh, question topic already, but I want to come back to it. So looking specifically at these proposed changes to Solvency 2 rules that, as you mentioned, have been proposed by the UK government and also in the EU, where do you see the biggest challenges and opportunities there? So the Bank of England earlier this year said that they could see an increase of 0.1% of bankruptcies in life insurance firms if capital rules on real assets are loosened. Uh, but the government has also speculated that there is a hundred billion pounds in capital that could be unleashed. So do you think it's too risky or is it a much needed change to sort of achieve both the levelling up goals that have been proposed by the government as well as just transition goals in general? I think that there are opportunities to improve solvency to without putting the future of the insurance industry at risk. I think that the pure milk of solvency two uh, is, in my view, uh, a bit. Um, I, I once, when I was a regulator, coined the phrase "reckless prudence," and I think that that may be a good way of describing it. So I think that um, some adjustments to the, um, you know, the the, the risk ma matching process, etc., to allow the longer term investments in longer term infrastructure projects makes a lot of sense. And um, I think that that, that uh, has been really an uh, unintended consequence of Solvency 2 to make it very difficult for life insurance companies to invest in very long dated uh, infrastructure um, assets. And since we need things like you know, Sizewell C, which we're assuming will will go ahead, uh, and are some of the other projects, HS2 type projects, mm. you know, where we do need that long term patient capital and life insurance companies are a good source of that because they do have very long term liabilities. Uh, so I think that there is scope there um, without throwing the prudential baby out with the investment bathwater or whatever. <laughs> I may be lost in my metaphor there, but uh, <laughs> So I, I think there's something to be done there. And I think that the bank have probably been uh, a bit, you know, they've been a bit curmudgeonly about that. Uh, and I think they may be uh, slightly exaggerating the risks. But once again, I come back to my point that I think that I don't think that this is going to be an absolutely radical change uh, in investment in the in the UK. It gives insurers a, a somewhat more flexibility to invest in some longer term assets, which are important because there are not many investors who are well placed to invest very long term in that way. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think that's it good. isn't going to create money that doesn't already exist. Mm -hmm. um, building on this, uh, where well, you mentioned those massive infrastructure projects like HS2 and uh, Sizewell. So what other ways should insurers, and specifically investment and asset management teams at insurers, be looking at for achieving growth? Are there more areas of regulation that can be curbed, or do you think there are untapped areas of investment or growth opportunity away from this that aren't currently being explored deeply enough? So for instance, is there any low-hanging fruit left which we haven't explored? There were low-hanging fruits, you know, I, I suspect it would have been harvested by now. Um, I mean, I think that uh, what investors need to look at is their their balance between uh, public and private equity. Uh, you know, the, it's pretty well uh, attested now that private equity uh, investments have typically done rather better than public markets um, mm. now on quite a large scale and over quite a long period of time. Um, and therefore, I think the notion, you know, that this phrase alternatives is a sort of slightly peculiar one. I mean, that gives you a sense that this is just some kind of punt, you know, with with 1% of your fund. I just don't think that's the way one should think of it now. So I think that uh, private equity and venture capital remains um, remains an important thing that, that in insurers should be looking hard at. Um, mm. But I think that one has to note that some of the ways in which insurance and pension fund investment have been oriented have been driven by changes to pension structures. You know, when when you had defined benefit schemes with, in principle, an infinite life, because there were always people coming in at the bottom as to, map, to balance out the people going out at the top, and therefore your, your fund had an infinite life, if you like. As soon as you switch from that to defined contribution, 
um, uh, which you know gives a more specific matching of assets and liabilities, and where there isn't a sort of infinite fund, if you like, then you know that necessarily produced a switch away uh, from equities into bonds, um, and that's not going to change. I don't see that bringing back defined benefit schemes is going to be on anybody's agenda. So mm. some of what's happened in terms of investment structure is driven by that. And that's a very fundamental point that has happened over the last 20 or 30 years. You know, when I started work, everybody went into a defined benefit scheme and that's the way you saw things. And therefore, you were quite comfortable, if you thought about it at all, with the pension being backed by very long term equities whose return yeah. over a long period of time was better. Uh, but, you know, uh, be because you didn't really have to worry about liquidity risk because there were always new people coming into the fund. Uh, and that's not the case now. Uh, so I, I don't think that one can expect a massive change in investment profile. Mm. A lot of areas there about the DB versus DC to take into consideration, but changing tack completely. So beyond solvency, uh, and also those areas you were just talking about, it seems as though more rules will come into place in the next few years, especially around sustainability and ESG. Now, how could such reforms impact both assisting and restricting economic growth and drive much needed investment into, say, the green transition, as well as helping the UK hit its net zero and other sustainability commitments? I think that it's going to be more a question of performance than than actual rules. Now, there are some changes that are coming in which uh, are having an impact, like the Bank of England is altering its bond buying profile to favour ESG funds, which uh, is likely to alter relative yields somewhat. But I think probably more important is that there's quite a bit of evidence that ESG type funds have actually outperformed uh, conventional funds. I mean, people have done calculations constructing, if you like, retrospectively constructing what an ESG fund would have looked like if you'd held it. Um, and, you know, those numbers suggest a degree of outperformance. Uh, and therefore, I'm not sure that it's going to be rules that drive this. I think it's going to be more people's perception of, you know, which companies um, are likely to benefit from this move towards net zero, even if mm. it turns out to be somewhat longer than perhaps we hope. And in the bank, uh, you know, we have to think about that uh, as well in terms of the type of companies to which we lend so that we are not lending to people whose collateral effectively is carbon in the ground that they may not be allowed to get out. And therefore, we, we have to think about that kind of lending. So I, I'm not sure that really regulation is going to drive this in the capital markets. I think it's going to be more investors' own perception, what a sensible positioning um, for the implications of net zero will be. Mm -hmm. And moving to the other, you mentioned carbon there. So I want to move on to slightly to the, my final question, the other parts of ESG. So how can regulators promote greater focus on the S and the G in the in ESG in an environment of emerging sustainability rules uh, amidst this cost of living crisis and government sensitivity to inequality and, and growing public attention to this area. So building on all of that, how can the systems both impact economic growth and broader ESG goals? Yeah, this is a this is a very difficult area. And I, I have to say that um, I am among the people who think that ESG as a as an acronym may have somewhat outlived its usefulness in that I think that the um, the emissions I mean carbon emissions and and how net zero is going to affect your business is not easy but it is measurable you know we do we've done quite a lot of work on it mm. in banks and in the accounting standard setters and everything else. Uh, to, to work on that and, and to produce reasonably meaningful measures. Now, governance, you know, can you really do that? I mean, uh, we, we've got a rather rigid corporate governance code in this in this country. Has that been a net benefit for mm. the UK economy? I don't know of any evidence to that effect, actually. Um, and so whether investors uh, should be 
investing on the basis of some sort of governance league tables. I don't know of any evidence in the way that I've just cited some in relation to net zero. I don't know of any evidence that, you know, you could have outperformed the market by investing in companies whose governance meets every particular criterion of every particular corporate governance code. Or And some of them, of course, have been uh, um, elaborated by people like ISS and Glass-Lewis, etc. So I, I don't think that you know, ESG, I think, is, is, is a decreasingly useful thing from an investor point of view. I think E and S can be can be pretty important. G, I think, is uh, more a matter of taste. You know, I mean, look at the big thing on G. You know, here we have the separation of government of chairman and chief executive in the U.S., basically not. Mm -hmm. um, such evidence as there is suggests that U.S. companies with a combined chairman and chief, chief executive do better than ones that don't. So, you know, uh, how are you going to turn that into an investment strategy? I, I really don't know. Really, really fascinating ideas to finish on there. Thank you very much for your time, Sir Howard. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. And if this has whetted your appetite for more of Sir Howard's thoughts, uh, please do go to clearpathanalysis.com to find some more information about the conference in September. And once again, I'd like to thank Sir Howard for his time today and look forward to seeing him speak in the uh, autumn. Thank you very much. Thank you.